gene expression. And in particular, we're going to try and answer the question of how mutations affect gene expression. And obviously, there's some things that go with this. Text references, hooray. So when we replicate DNA, we need to always have that free 3 prime end, and we get that by using primers. Hooray and hip hip primers are RNA. So it behooves us to, to spend a little bit of time talking about RNA. So when we look at DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, what we see is it's double-stranded and it happens to have a sugar phosphate on the outside and we have nitrogenous bases in the middle. Adenine base paired with thymine, cytosine base paired with guanine, hydrogen bonds stabilize. When we look at RNA, ribonucleic acid, what we happen to notice is it's for the most part single-stranded. That does not mean that it exists all as one single line. What that means is it's going to fold up on itself, kind of like protein. It happens to have a sugar phosphate backbone, and the bases tend to be in the middle, and they will complementarily base pair with others, adding with uracil, cytosine with guanine. When I try and look at the big picture, what I end up generating is something that we call the central dogma of, of molecular biology. Meaning, I can make DNA, or I can take DNA and make more DNA, DNA replication, or I can take DNA and make RNA, we could call that transcription, or I can work backwards and go RNA to DNA, that's called reverse transcription, and in some cases I can take that RNA and I can turn it into a protein, and we call that process translation. So let's deal with the two major processes, meaning DNA to RNA and RNA to protein. In here there's other bits and pieces, so things that we call RNA replication or then we have reverse transcription. That's not what we're trying to deal with. So if I look at a gene, and it doesn't matter what the gene is, what I'm going to happen to have are a few pieces in common. I'm going to have a starting point, so we have some type of initiation, and we refer to that typically as the TATA box. We'll have our structural gene, Somewhere we're going to have a stopping point to say stop this gene from being transcribed, but we'll also have some regulatory sections, so some things that are help turn this thing on or turn this thing off. Every gene in existence is going to have combinations of those things. The extent to which you have parts will determine something about your gene itself. So if I look at transcription, Transcription will start at what we call plus one or the TATA box, and at the TATA box, which is thymines and adenines, RNA polymerase can bind, provided there's nothing stopping it. When it binds, it will un automatically unwind the DNA, and we'll have a free three prime end. We'll add a starting RNA, and then we'll just continuously add onto that three prime end. We'll continue doing that until it stops. What you end up getting is a massive piece of RNA. The five prime end sticks out. Why would that be the part sticking out? Because you can't add to the three or onto a five prime end. Three prime end is where we're adding more nucleotides, and we'll keep going till the gene is finished being transcribed. How does it stop? There can be a whole bunch of different ways that we stop this, but needless to say, it just stops. That'll be the easiest thing for us to say. It just stops. The catch becomes, that's, that's too simple. So is this the same process for eukaryotes and prokaryotes? And that's a two-edged question. So are the steps the same? Yes. Do we get the same outcomes? The answer turns out to be a no. What we do know is all DNA, if there's a gene, it will form RNA. The catch is with bacteria, they go from RNA, then they, then they can immediately go into protein synthesis, so translation, if necessary. With eukaryotes, that's not true. What we do instead is we modify our RNA. In particular, this type of RNA is what we call an mRNA or a messenger RNA. We'll end up doing three things. The first bit is we're going to take out chunks of the RNA itself pieces that we call introns. Introns are segments of DNA, or pardon me, of RNA that we are not going to turn into a protein. So they're just pieces as buffers. So in case we're having lots of mutations, 
we can use those as little buffers. So, hey, hopefully a mutation happens here and nothing, we don't need to worry about anything else. We could also use them as a shuffle point. We'll talk about that a lot later. So we'll cut out our introns. What we're going to do is add a cap onto the 5 prime end, what we call a 5 prime methylated guanosine or MEG cap. So we add a cap to say, I belong here, don't get rid of me. We're also going to add a poly A tail, meaning a whole bunch of adenines, to the 3 prime end, and that's going to be a couple hundred amino acids long, or nucleotides long, and the result of that will be, hey, I belong here, please don't get rid of me. That's what we do as eukaryotes. We chop out parts of the middle, chop out the introns, we leave the parts that get expressed, or the exons, we add a 5 prime cap, and we add a 3 prime tail. Assuming that all has happened, what we can now do is start worrying about making a protein. Not all RNA makes proteins. So we could have some genes that code for messenger RNA, and that ultimately will make a protein. We could have genes that code for ribosomal RNA, and that is going to help build the ribosome. We could have genes that code for tRNA, and those will sit there and transfer amino acids. We could also deal with all the other versions of RNA too, but the point is not all RNA makes a protein. Genes make RNA. Some RNA make proteins. When I look at the ribosome, what I turn out to notice is it's actually brilliant. The functional units of it, it's broken up into two pieces, a large and a small piece. The parts of it that turn out to work is it has RNA and it has protein. If I remove the protein from it, it works. It's not that great, but it works. If I remove the RNA from the ribosome, nothing happens. The moral of that story is we need to have, our, we need the RNA in order to make the ribosome functional. Also looking at this picture, you'll notice that there's three colorful portions in the middle what we call the amino acyl binding site, the peptidyl binding site, and the t exit site. I call those the ape. So A is the pink, P is the green, E is the yellow. Here's the way I'm going to end up describing it. The A site is where we add new tRNA. The P site is where we make the peptide or the protein bond. And the E is the exit point. That seems simple enough. When I put this thing together, what I actually end up doing is I have my mRNA. I actually start by attaching some tRNAs that will cause the formation of the ribosome. And when we have the ribosome there, we can now start to translate. The catch is translation isn't nice and one-to-one, -one, meaning I can't go one nucleotide to one amino acid. If I do two nucleotides, I still couldn't get all 20 amino acids. So I need actually three of them. And what you end up create, getting is something that looks like this, which is the genetic code. If you happen to have AUG as your codon, codon being a little segment of DNA that is going to end up telling you, here's the amino acid. So if I look for a codon of AUG, what I can do is, on this picture, go to the A, which is on the first letter. I go to column U. So we have A, U, and then I have to go till I see, down till I see G. A, U, G codes for the amino acid called MET, which is methionine. Why do I point that out? Methionine turns out to be the start codon. It's one of four codons I happen to know off the top of my head. The other 60, I am the slightest clue, I have to look them up. A, U, G is the universal start codon, or the near universal start codon. The stop codons, are UAA, UAG, and UGA. And if you look in there, you can find UAAs right there. Come on, bigger mouse. It doesn't want to play with me. There we go. UAA, UAG, and UGA. So they're there. So what we end up doing is we'll have a new tRNA come in. It'll bind to a brand new codon. What will happen is... In, so it's going to add to the A site. In the P site, we're going to transfer an entire growing chain of proteins 
onto the amino acid on the A site, and then the entire structure shifts down one codon. What will that do? That will allow for a tRNA to leave. We'll add a new transfer, or transfer RNA to the A site. At the P site, we'll move and make the peptide bond. We'll shift everything down again. tRNA leaves. We'll add a new tRNA at, to the A site. The P site, we transfer the peptide bond. We slide down again. That tRNA leaves, and we repeat this over and over and over again. In class, we drew it out. I'm not going to draw it out here. How do we eventually stop this thing? Well, it's pretty simple. Once we reach one of the stop codons, and that enters into the A site, what's going to happen is when we go and try and transfer the peptide bond at the P site, there's going to be nothing to grab onto. So when there's nothing to grab onto, the peptide is now free to float away. And as it floats away, the tRNA will leave, the this release factor, or the stop tRNA will leave, and the ribosome will fall apart, free for us to try again. We don't stop there. Prokaryotes, transcription, translation, boom, we're done. We, eukaryotes, still modify our protein. So we're going to add sugars onto it, we're going to chop parts off, we're going to rearrange pieces. That's going to be the job of the Golgi apparatus. So we actually make our proteins inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. We ship those over to the Golgi apparatus where they get modified, and from there, they get shipped off to whatever's going on with them. The whole point of this chat, which is long, was, so what do mutations do? It depends. Some mutations, so if we look at this example here, so the DNA is TTC, so when it's coded into mRNA through transcription, we get an AAG that's going to code for lysine. The, so if you took the, the um, genetic code and looked up AAG as the codon, what you should find is LYS, which is lysine. Easy enough. Well, what if we had a mutation that turned the C into a T? Well, the result is the codon goes from AAG to AAA, but that still codes for lysine, which means... We wouldn't know. That's a mutation that did nothing. If I had a mutation that turned the first thymine into an adenine, so instead of TTC, I had ATC, that would end up being transcribed as UAG, which is one of the three stop codons. This is probably going to be bad because we're putting in a stop when I shouldn't have had a stop. What I could also do is I could do some other stranger mutations. So if I take TTC and turn it into TCC, well, I get instead of arginine, or pardon me, instead of lysine is arginine, A-R-G, ARG, both of them turn out to be positively charged amino acids, which means that might not be so bad. It could be worse. So we might not know anything. But we could also go from TTC to TGC, which will go from lysine to threonine, and threonine is nothing like lysine. It's a polar amino acid, whereas lysine has a charge to it. The result is, I don't know what this is going to do. So what are mutations going to do to your DNA? The response is, change it. That's all we know. Are they good? We don't know. Are they bad? We don't know. It depends on what the mutation turns out to be. But the big point is if you change DNA, you're going to change RNA. If you change RNA, you might change codons. And if you change the codon, that may or may not have ramifications, which is strange.